There was a defendant who was on trial for murder. The case against him was really strong. There was a lot of evidence against him. But the problem that the prosecution was having was that there was no corpse. They didn't have the body of the person who had actually been killed. So during closing arguments, the defense lawyer says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have a surprise for you. Within the next minute, the person who is presumed dead will walk into the doors of this courtroom. And everybody in the jury turns and watches the doors and sits and waits in anticipation. And then after a minute, the, the lawyer said, I made up that last statement, but you all looked. And so there must be a reasonable doubt in your mind that the, my defendant actually committed this crime. So you have to acquit him. The jury deliberated and then they came back and they read out a guilty verdict for him. The foreman said, yes, we all looked and watched the door, but your client didn't. And it removed the reasonable doubt from their minds. We all have some form of doubt in our lives. We face it, we, we wrestle with it, we think through these things. Maybe in church you've heard that doubt is always a bad thing. But you couldn't survive in this modern world if you didn't doubt. <laughs> I, I got a phone call a couple of years ago and uh, it was a local number and so I answered the phone and the person said, I am a manager for Publisher Clearinghouse and you have won. Our team is, and he named a town that was like 15 minutes away, said, will you accept the prize? We need a little information and then we will come to your house. Uh, first, I doubted that I had won since I had not entered a publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. And second, I doubted they would call me on their way to give me the prize, like in, when they were only 10 minutes away, 15 minutes away. And third, I doubted that a manager for Publishers Clearinghouse would get the name of the company wrong and keep calling it Publisher Clearinghouse. And so I grilled the guy for like 10 minutes trying to make him prove to me that he really was from Publishers Clearinghouse. And basically it came down to him saying, you can trust me because I'm a manager at Publisher Clearinghouse. And then he hung up on me when I told him that I would call Publishers Clearinghouse and see if that was really the case. Now, it's good for us to doubt things sometimes. We should doubt emails coming to us from Nigerian princes. Oh, we should doubt miracle weight loss products or miracle hair growth products. Doubt can be healthy, but there can also be unhealthy doubt as well. It can become so ingrained in us that we become cynical. We've been hurt. We've been lied to so many times that we're not willing to go there again. And so we just don't believe anything. That type of doubt can damage relationships when we don't believe the people closest to us, even though they're telling the truth. Sometimes we also have doubt when it comes to the big questions of life. Maybe the most famous doubter of all time was a guy named Thomas. Now we have a phrase in the English language, doubting Thomas. But this phrase is so common that people know the phrase who don't even know that it came from the Bible. And uh, even when I lived in Mozambique for a couple of years, I was working with uh, doing some showings of the Jesus film. We went into remote areas and we told people about Jesus and we used this film uh, that talked about the life of Jesus based on the book of Luke. And there was one scene in there where regularly there was always like a, a chuckle and kind of a murmur that went through the crowd. And so eventually I asked one of my co-workers and friends there, a Mozambican leader who, who spoke multiple languages, I said, why do they always laugh at this part? And he said, they've all heard about doubting Thomas, but they didn't know he was a real person. They'd heard the phrase doubting Thomas. Today we are looking at Thomas from the Bible. And we see how he wanted proof that Jesus really was raised from the dead. We come across a story in John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This was after his death 
and after his resurrection, and he appeared to his disciples in this locked room. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, who is also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples, disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I see, unless I can know for myself. Can you blame him? I mean, he, he wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And I, I can imagine he was thinking, maybe they're just hallucinating about this. I mean, they, it's really hard to accept that Jesus actually died. Maybe he was thinking, I know you really miss him, guys. I, I know a piece of him will always live in our hearts, but that doesn't mean he's actually alive. Maybe he even thought that if they kept this up, then he was going to need to confront them about it and have a serious talk. Thomas doubted, but wouldn't you if you were in the same position? Uh, if someone tells you that Aunt Gertie is raised from the dead, <laughs> I would probably be with Thomas on that. You know, they might be a phrase called doubting Jonathan, if that were the point. You know, if we're honest, then most of us face doubts in our lives at some point or another. Everyone faces doubt. We doubt to different degrees and we doubt different aspects. Some people doubt if God exists at all, if there really is a supreme being that created this universe. Other people may believe in that, but say, this Jesus thing, I, how could God have a son? And some people doubt and say, maybe the church just made up this this whole thing in order to keep people docile and content in the world so that they could be led like sheep. And other people say, yes, Jesus was a good teacher, but I don't know about those miracles. You know, I've never lived my whole life and I've never seen a miracle. He's a good teacher, but I don't believe that he could have cast out demons because that's not the way the real world really works. We might doubt those things. We might doubt other things, but we all come across doubt in our lives. So the question for it is, for us is, what do we do when doubt comes? How did Jesus respond when Thomas doubted? Did he say, how dare you not believe the word of these disciples? Did he lay into him and start yelling at him for not having enough faith? Did he send them out and say he wasn't worthy of being a follower of Jesus? Verse 26 continues. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Did he flame him for not trusting him immediately? No. Jesus offered proof. He goes on to say, stop doubting and believe. That's an action that Jesus wants him to take. Thomas had a say in his doubt. We all do. Well, the doubt might come, but how we respond is the question. Do we, do we entertain it or do we refuse to believe evidence? When we see evidence for it, what do we need to do? When we experience doubts, we look for evidence. I encourage you, with whatever you're, you're questioning, pursue that question. There are, if you're, when it comes to issues of faith and the Christian faith, the technical term things you want to search for are apologetics. And these are logical, reasoned defenses of the faith. And they won't convince you to believe, but you could, we can see that there are reasons that support faith. And so we can be open to it without having to check our brains at the door when we come to faith. 
Sometimes you will find things in there that might resolve the inner conflict that you feel. It's important for us to remember that God is bigger than us. He knows more. His ways are, are higher than we are. So we're not going to be able to understand everything perfectly clearly. It's not going to be just crystal clear for us. Ultimately, we have to recognize that God is God and we are not. The script, in the scriptures in the Old Testament, there's a man named Job. And Job went through tremendous suffering. And he and his friends and his wife asked God why. They were trying to understand and to wrap their minds around how this good person would be suffering so much. At the end of this long book, there are 42 chapters in the book of Job. And the, toward the very end of this book, starting in, verse, in chapter 38, finally, the Lord starts speaking to Job and his friends, but he doesn't really give the answers that Job is looking for. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a, a measuring line across it? On what were its footing steps or set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? God is asking Job how much he knows. Where were you when I created the universe? Do you know how this happened or that happened? Have you been to the bottom of the ocean? Do you know how large the earth is? How did you, how do you do this? How did this happen? Verse 18, God says, tell me if you know all of this. And then verse 21, he says, surely you are know, you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. I love this because this is a theological grounding for sarcasm. So yes, your teenagers were made in the image of God. <laughs> God is sarcastic to Job here. And this goes on, his response to Job goes on for four chapters without him giving the answer of why Job is suffering. But God is reminding Job that God is bigger than we are. There is a place for doubt and for questioning in our lives and in our faith walk. But ultimately, we have to recognize that we can't know everything. We won't know everything, understand everything fully. So what do we do with those doubts? We need to be honest with God about them. When we come to him with our doubts, Jesus meets us in them. He knows our thoughts. He knows who we are and what we're worrying about and what we're questioning, just like he did with Thomas. Verse 28 continues when Jesus says to, to feel the nail holes and the spear hole in his side. Then Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Campbell Morgan was a preacher in the 1800s, and he started off really young. He started off preaching his first sermon at 13 years old, and he got really good at it. He was known as the boy preacher. But by the time he was about 19, he had a, a crisis of faith, as he described it. He was attacked by doubts about the Bible, if it was true. And so he studied a lot of the, the best atheist and agnostic thinkers of the time. He read their books. He listened to them uh, speak. And he wondered what he should do. He decided that he shouldn't go on preaching, that he needed to cancel all of his speaking engagements until he had this figured out. So he bought a new Bible, and basically he locked the door. He said, I'm no longer sure that this is what my father claims it to be. The word of God. But of this I am sure, if it is the word of God, and if I come to it with an unprejudiced and open mind, 
it will bring assurance to my soul itself. Well, he spent time poring over the Bible, reading it with an open mind, and asking God if he was real to speak to him about his word. The results, he said, the Bible found me. He devoted the rest of his life to studying and teaching the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, this, this chapter, this part of the chapter is talking about the armor of God and how as people of faith we can put on God's armor and how it protects us in battle. And one of the pieces of armor that he calls us to take up is the shield of faith. He says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In those days, the Roman soldiers would carry large leather shields uh, into battle and some battles, and they would be able to soak that in water so that when the flaming arrows would come, it would put out those arrows. One of the flaming arrows that the enemy of our soul attacks us with is doubt. And the shield of faith can help us face our doubts. Selwyn Hughes says, those who doubt most and yet strive to overcome their doubts turn out to be some of Christ's strongest disciples. So what happens with Thomas here? The one that we know as Doubting Thomas. There in verse 28, Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. That Jesus' reality hit him powerfully. Now, before this, the disciples had called Jesus rabbi. They had called him teacher. They had called him the son of God. They had called him Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. But they had never before called him God. The Jewish leaders would not have hesitated to pass a death sentence on Thomas for this because it was blasphemy to call a man God. It was a dangerous thing for him to say. But Thomas was honest with his doubts, and he was the first one to clearly call Jesus God. Jesus said, blessed are those who haven't seen, but still have believed. He said they are blessed. Thomas spent the rest of his life making sure that as many people as possible had the opportunity to hear even though they didn't see it themselves. Christian tradition tells us that Thomas was the disciple who traveled the farthest in preaching and spreading the word. He went on from Jerusalem, he went to Babylon, and then went throughout Persia and all the way to India. And there are churches today in southern India that trace their heritage to Thomas, this apostle, the one who doubted. Do you have doubts? Let God into them. Jesus will meet you in your doubts. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that we can come to you openly and honestly with our doubts and our questions. We pray that you would speak to each of us what we need to hear from you. With the things that we're struggling with or wrestling with, but help us to, to see your truth. And we pray that we won't be satisfied until we, we understand enough for what we're supposed to understand from you, what we're supposed to hear from you. And Lord, help us to find the right resources that can help us with the apologetics to understand the logical underpinnings of our faith. And Lord, help us to be strong as you speak to us through these times, help us to walk in the faith that we discover and grow us in you. We pray this in your name. Amen.